Our second Timothy chapter three, verses one through five. Let's start with verse three. It says, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Verse 3, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And verse 5, having a form of godliness but denying its power. And from such people turn away. Today I want to preach to you under the unction of the Holy Ghost a message that he has given to me. I'm calling Vessels of Power. Y'all ready for the word? If you're in the house with me today, would you pray with me for just a moment? Let's pray over this word. Let's prepare our hearts for what he's about to do. Jesus, help us to receive your word here this morning. You have prepared a meal for us today, and we're hungry for it. We come ready for what you have for us today. Have your way in our hearts. Have your way in our minds. Have your way in our lives. Wash us in the water of your word here this morning. Cleanse us. Renew us. Fill us up in this house here today. We don't want to leave the same way that we came in, God. Just open our ears to hear. Open our hearts to receive what you have for us today let every distraction fade and let your voice be clear to your people in this morning in Jesus precious name we pray and the family said amen, amen. you may be seated Paul is telling us perilous times are coming perilous times are coming now he didn't say this to freak everybody out he didn't say it to scare everybody. He was prophesying. But the prophetic doesn't always just say doom and gloom. It's not all the bad stuff all the time. Here, Paul is prophesying to prepare the church for the days ahead. Everybody say a prophecy to prepare. This was written about 2,000 years ago in 65 A.D. And Paul here, he's about to be killed by King Nero. He tells his son in the faith, Timothy, he says, listen, there's days that are coming that are going to be perilous. There's days that are coming that are going to be challenging. There's days that are coming that are going to be filled with all kinds of wickedness. I tell you today, it's not the focus of my message, but I... I'd say if we went down the list that Paul gave us, I think we would find, we'd find that list pretty easily. Yeah. Everything that he listed there, I think it would take about maybe five to ten minutes on your job to spot most of the things on this list. Yeah. It'd take you about 30 seconds online to spot everything that he said right here that's happening right now. He said perilous times are coming. I'm here to tell you today, church, I think we are in those times. You can look around and see lovers of pleasures. You can see boasters, proud people, the people that are blasphemers, people that are unforgiving, unloving, unthankful. Everywhere you look, you see this list that he's talking about. And there's this phrase, though, that Paul, he ends on. And it, it jumps out the page at me. He, he, it, it's something that gripped my heart this week. And I said, I have to convey this message to this church. It's in verse number five. They will have... A form of godliness, but denying its power. This is a revelation the Lord gave me, and I hope to convey it to you today. I've heard the scripture many times in my life. I've never seen it quite like this throughout the word, weaved together in the way that I'm going to try to convey it to you this morning. Of all the kinds of people that would exist in perilous times, there will be a people who will have a form of godliness, but denying the power. Everybody say a form. Form there in the Greek is the word morphosis. I looked up what morphosis means, and I think that you'll be very intrigued as how that might correlate with today's word. It refers to an outward form 
or appearance that may lack the essence or power that it represents. I'm going to go in today, so y'all better stay. Y'all better like be locked in early. Anybody here ever poured some concrete? You got anybody here that's, I'm going to see, okay, you got calluses on your hem looking here. We got mainly folks in the room. We got some ladies that know their way around some concrete too, maybe. Okay, all right. If you know, if you know a little bit about concrete, you're going, to know, you're going to know what this is right here. Now, this is a, this is a form. It even says it right here on the tube. It just says, it says form tube right here. If you're wondering what it is. Now, this form tube, if you were to pour concrete, let's just say you wanted to make some sort of a, um, a pillar or like some sort of post or, or a footer. What you would do is you'd take the concrete and you'd mix it up real good and you'd get it all just right and you'd get it kind of the consistency of maybe peanut butter or some oatmeal or something and you kind of get it all just right where it's there and then, and then you pour it into this form. If you were to try to make some sort of post out of concrete without the form, you're going to have some trouble. You could try real hard. You try to get all that stuff that's all over here and you try to get it and get it to make, make some sort of form, but it would not happen without the shape of the form here. So then you take the contents of the concrete and you pour it inside of the form. Now, once the form, once the concrete has cured, once it's dried, you can do whatever you want with the form. Some people take it off, some people leave it on. It depends on what you want to do. But what you have is a perfectly round, cylindrical piece of concrete because of the form. Now, the form is all shape and no substance. The form is only as strong as what's inside. See, you can try... To put some sort of weight on this, but this is just cardboard. I don't know if you can see it there. This is just cardboard. You could try to put some weight on it. You could try to make it and use it as, a, as your footer. You could try to build something on it, but everybody here knows it's not going to work. Because after a while, this cardboard is going to decay. After a while, this cardboard here is going to fall apart. It's only what's inside that gives it its strength. All right, try this. How many of you have a family? I better see some hands here now. That'd be weird. Y'all got a family. All right, so, so how many of y'all live in some sort of home? Some a home of some sort. I mean, it's an apartment, a home, a house, something. Okay, the rest of you are homeless. All right, let's keep going. That house is the form for your family. But if you take the people out of the house... All you've got is a building. You don't have a home. Because the house is just the farm. And to take it home, to, to make it a home, you've got to put the substance in it. You've got to fill it with the right contents. And the right contents for a house is a family which makes it a home. You not only have structure... Now, when you put the family in it, now you've got the substance. Let's go a step further. A form is created oof, with the intention to be filled. See, God decided to make man in his image. Man, y'all, if, if I'm going to talk about it in a minute, but if goosebumps were a sign that the Holy Ghost was here, I can guarantee you I'm feeling those right about now. It's not a sign, but it feels like one. He was looking for someone in the visible world that could represent an invisible God. See, the best way to represent a spiritual God is for him to create a spirit man. But for the spirit man to have permission and to have authority to operate in a visible world called earth, God knew that he would have to give man a form. He, 
a spiritual God decided I need someone to represent me to be made in my image. And the best way to do that is to make a spirit man. But if a spirit man is to operate and work in authority here on this visible physical earth, he says, I must make this spirit man a physical form. And if you remember, God, when he created the sun, when he, when he created the moon and the stars, he spoke them into existence. The sea creatures and the birds and the land animals, he spoke them into existence. He said, let there be light, and then there was light. But he did not speak man into existence. He didn't think man into existence. The Bible says that he reached down and grabbed the dirt and then he created the form of Adam. I don't know what Adam looked like. I don't know if he was short or tall or narrow or wide. Y'all like that? 2024 way of saying it. But whatever shape he was in, the form wasn't enough. See, the Bible says that God took a deep breath and breathed his breath into the nostrils of this form named Adam. And that form now became a living soul. What God had formed was now filled. See, if we're not careful, we're going to look at people, and all we're going to see is their form. If we're not careful, we're going to look at them and only judge them from what we can see from the outside. But I'm trying to tell you the best part of me, the most powerful part of me, is not the part that you can see. The most powerful part of you is not the stuff that someone else can see inside of you. Greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. Greater is he that's inside of me than anything you can see. Whatever God's got inside is much greater than anything that we can see physically on the outside. Everybody say there's an inward man. See... Ephesians 3 and 16 says that he would grant you according to the, the riches of his glory to be strengthened with the might through his spirit in the inner man. 2 Corinthians 4 and 16. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Oh, for those of us that are aging a little bit in the room, this is really, really refreshing. So even though outwardly... This part of me is perishing. Even though outwardly my bones are aching. Even though outwardly my back seems like I might be 96 years old sometimes. Even though outwardly things don't seem to go just right. I'm trying to tell you inwardly God says I've got a fresh anointing for you. Inwardly I've got a fresh impartation for you. Even though I'm getting older, even though the outside is perishing slowly but surely, he said, it's what's on the inward man that matters. I can't stop there. I got to take it one step deeper. See, how many know that when God created the church, he also gave it a form? Some people, they're, they're all right with the idea that God, you know, gave man a form. But they reject the idea that God gave the church a form. They say stuff like, well, I'm a child of God all by myself. I don't need no stinking church. But if you understand the plan of God, then you realize that God loves and he saves us as individuals. But you can never be the church by yourself. That's why Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst. See, the church, 
I'm going to hurt somebody here. The church isn't me, and the church isn't you. The church is us. We are the body of Christ. And we can't have a body without a form. Oh, some of y'all are tracking with me today. We need the form because without it, God has nothing to fill. Well, pastor, what you talking about up there? What's the form of the church? Tell me what that means. The church has worship, has leadership, it has stewardship, has fellowship, it has discipleship. The church has, it provides doctrine and structure and programming and Christian education and personal development. The church has buildings. The church has schedules and leaders and apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers and bishops. There is tangible and touchable form to the church. This entity of the church is something that can be touched, it can be seen, it can be felt, it is a form. So while on one hand the spiritual church of God is very spiritual, on the other hand it is a tactile form that we can see and we can touch. Some churches have elaborate buildings. Some churches are storefronts. Some churches meet in tents. Some meet in homes. They're all forms. Everybody say forms. forms. You and I have a form, and the body of Christ has a form. Everybody say form. form. I like that. Somebody was kind of late with it, but you got it in there. <laughs> you and I have a form, and the body of Christ has a form. The problem is what Paul was telling us was coming. He said there would be a day when the people would have a form. There was people that would have a form of godliness. They would have a structure. Oh, I'm really preaching to you now. They would have a structure of godly people. They would have the components of what godliness looks like. They look churchy their church looks like a church they seem religious they have the right spiritual vocabulary they have influence they have songs they have sermons they have the right form but the problem is that paul was pointing out to us is that just because they have his form doesn't mean they have his power If God forms it, somebody needs to write this down. He intends to fill it. In the beginning, I like that by itself. Y'all, I, I don't mean, if we talk about chill bumps, every time I hear that, I get some chill bumps. There ain't no more powerful phrase in all the world than in the beginning, God. But anyways, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and it was void darkness was on the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters and then within five days he had formed the earth but on day six he completed the crescendo of his creation which is mankind but see God didn't create the earth for the devil to fill he created the earth for man to fill See, he told Adam, he says, go forth and multiply. Get out there and fill this earth because I designed it for you. You are to take dominion over this earth that I have designed for you, mankind. And only until man, get it, only until man had filled the form that he'd created called earth, could God accomplish his attention Intention for earth. See, the problem comes when you have things that are purposely formed, but they're never filled. This isn't my message today, but I'm going to try to tell you very quickly here while I'm at this point that we all have a form and we all have a void. The issue comes in when we have this intentional form and it's intended to be filled by God and His Spirit. 
But because when we don't fill it with his spirit and the true godliness that comes only from him, something's got to go in there. Something has to fit in this void. That's where we end up with issues. That's where we end up with problems because the strength, is, it's, uh, the, the, the strength of this is only determined by what's inside. So if someone is feeling weak, it's because you need to check on what's inside. If someone's fa constantly falling and, fa and failing and constantly in their trouble after trouble after trouble and everything seems to be falling apart, we have to check what's inside. No, I'm, thinking, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'm preaching on, uh, on, on forgiveness and God given many, uh, many, many chances. I'm not saying we can't mess up. I'm trying to say if we consistently are falling to the same thing, there is a gap here that needs to be filled with the Holy Ghost. But verse 5, is, it's not talking about a form of, of wickedness. No, it's... It's talking about a form of godliness. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you what. It would be very easy, I mean, a whole lot easier at least, to spot a form of wickedness. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? We're like, oh, that's wicked. <laughs> yep. I mean, honestly, though, I don't know. I, I was thinking about this, and even when I wrote a couple of these notes down for this, and I'm thinking, you know what? I don't know. Maybe I think it's harder and harder for, for the modern church to spot wickedness. That's a whole other subject for another time. But I'm afraid some wickedness doesn't even look so wicked anymore. No wonder it's going to be extra hard to determine whether or not it's a form of godliness or a form of wickedness if it all looks like the same thing. I'm going to turn around for a minute take a drink. I came today with a pastoral warning. You need to be careful who you follow. Listen carefully. Not everybody that has a following should be followed. Oh, they're preaching this and they're saying that. And I got some good stuff to say online. And I saw, I saw this and they're preaching this scripture. And they got this. They got a whole bunch of people in their church. They must know what they're talking about. They got a whole bunch of people that follow them. Not everybody that's got a following should be followed. Not everybody that's got a form of godliness is filled with godliness. You don't know about their life. You don't know what consecration they've got. You don't know what's going on with them. You don't follow just somebody out there because they got something good to say. I'm trying to tell you, don't follow them just because they got a following. Follow the one that God has put in front of you to lead you and your family to heaven. Be careful what voices you let into your sanctified soul. There are some things that look godly, but if you look past the surface, you're going to find that there is no oil in there. You're going to look and you're going to find that there's no anointing in there. There's no consecration in there. There's no separation from the world in there. Therefore, there will be no transformation. If you look close enough, there's nothing wrong with having a form. It's all right to have a form. It's a good thing to have a form. God created the form, but the form was never to be meant to be the end in itself. If God forms it, he intends to fill it. His intention from the beginning was to fill, get this, to fill the form of man with his power. He had a plan from the very beginning. It was to fill the form of man with his power. But, but there's more to that verse. It keeps going. Notice that Paul isn't saying that beware of the people that are wrestling with doubt. They're doubting the power of God. You know, he's not saying, like, beware of those people and run away from those people. No, 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 no. No, that's welcome here, okay? Somebody that's struggling in their faith, struggling with doubt, struggling to try to work through all that stuff, this is the place to be, okay? It'd be a lot like saying, don't come to the hospital until you're completely healed. Once you're completely better, then come on in here. We'll check you out. We'll celebrate it. No, no, no. If you're struggling with your faith 
if you're struggling with, with doubt, if you're fighting, you're j- just trying to fight to keep afloat and you're trying to do things right, the last thing you do is stay away from this place. The first thing you do is try to get into this place. This is a place of healing. This is a place that helps bring faith, impart faith, help you with your marriage, help you with your home, helping you with knowing that God is beside you and he won't leave you nor forsake you. This is the place to remind you of that. So he doesn't say, beware of doubters. Yo, I fight doubt sometimes. I'm a human being just like you. There's doubt that comes to all of us. Can we be real in the house and say sometimes it visits us? Sometimes what I see with my eyes doesn't line up with the promises that I've been given by God. Oh, are we going to be real? Sometimes what I'm seeing right now isn't exactly what I thought I should be seeing right now. So doubt visits us from time to time. So what do you do when the voice of doubt comes to you and says, if God were good, this wouldn't be happening to me? What do you do in these moments when doubt comes and bombards your mind? Why is this happening to me? You have to do something with that voice. You, you can't accept that voice and just move from, un, uh, just, just nar- marinate in that, that, that voice that's speaking into your mind. Because that doubt then moves to unbelief. Somebody needs to take a picture of this because I think that's a new way of writing notes these days. <laughs> unbelief is the manifestation of doubt. That was never addressed with the truth of God. If you ever ever hear a voice that causes you to second guess the promises of God's word in your life. Don't just sit there and just, just, just rest in that and let that just spin in your mind. And that voice of doubt just get there and turn and churn and marinate over in your mind. No, no. What do you do in those moments? You put your shoulders back and you point your finger at that lion devil. And then you open your mouth and you tell him, I have come too far by faith. I have never seen the righteous forsaken. I believe the report of the Lord. I know that my Redeemer lives. I'm standing on the promises of God. If he's stelling you doubt and he's marinating that stuff in your mind, you point your finger at him and say, no, I've come too far by faith. I've never seen the righteous forsaken taken or his seed begging for bread I'm trying to tell you I know my redeemer lives listen we don't shout because we've never had doubt we shout because when the doubt shows up we chose to believe God in spite of it I don't shout because everything's perfectly fine in my life. You see somebody doing backflips across here. First of all, that's impressive. Number two, it's not because everything's right in their life. It's because even though stuff is going wrong in my life, God's still good. Looking around and seeing some of these people clapping and shouting and raising their hands. You don't know what I know about them as their pastor. That they've been going through Hades all week long. And somehow they got their hands raised. Somehow they're crying. Somehow they're smiling. Somehow they're shouting. It's not because it's honky-dory in their life. It's because Jesus is still good. Somebody shout yes. Yes. Honky dory. I don't even know if I'm allowed to say that. Maybe I am. I saw you got it. She got it. There's a world of difference between those wrestling with doubt and those searching for God's power, and then those that are denying it. You understand that? I don't know if you've ever asked somebody out and got denied, but I have. Y'all, that don't feel good at all. (laughs) Man, putting yourself out there. 
I've done it. I have wrote, I've written some letters. I mean, it is a long time ago, of course. But I mean, I wrote some letters. I put myself out there. This is before like online stuff, you know what I mean? They, they didn't have that back then. So you had to like physically write it out. But I'd be, I'd really put yourself out there, man. Look here, I'm gonna make my, I'm gonna make my best pitch as to why I'm the one. <laughs> nope. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> Denied. See, deniers say, I see the invitation, but no thanks. Deniers say, I'm good. No, no, that's that's fine. That's fine. No. No, thank you. Denier says, I, I, here's what they're saying. I don't believe in you. I don't believe you're right for me. I don't, I don't think this is going to work out. Deniers say, no. They stop it right then and there. there. There's way too many people in the church of God that are denying the power of God. I see you, God. I see that you have power. I see you have something special planned. I see that there's more, but no thanks. It's not for me. I'd rather not. I appreciate the invitation, but we're not meant for each other. Maybe later. Maybe, maybe not now. I see the level of consecration that's necessary, but I'm not ready for that right now. They are denying the power of God. But let a crisis come. Let a crisis visit their home. Let a doctor tell them a little something that they, that's, that's distressing to hear. And suddenly, they know where to turn. Suddenly, they go, hey, you know what? I, I might have mocked this a little bit. I might have said that maybe I don't, I don't think this is for me. I'm not sure about all that. I'd rather not have that in my life right now. But when they're desperate for a miracle, they come slipping in the back door. Because they know there's something here. Because this is a form. And inside this form is the spirit and power of God. And there's power here that breaks chains. There's power here to take the alcohol out of the alcoholic. There's power here to take the disease out of the disease. There's power here to mend the broken. There's power here to bring life back to the lifeless. There is power of God here. Everybody say there's power. I like it. My concern is the same as Paul's. We are living in a day where people have a form of godliness. But they're denying the power. When we talk about power, it, it, I mentioned this earlier, it's not an emotion. It's, uh, it's not goosebumps. It's not, it's not what it is. You could say, oh, I'm, you know, the power of God's here and the chill bumps are on my arm. Listen, I get that. That feels neat, but that is not power within itself. The power I'm talking about is spiritual. It might manifest itself as a feeling, but power is not a feeling. I'm talking about an undeniable, an unstoppable, an unshakable an uncontainable power that comes from God himself. You can't have enough goosebumps to contain the power of God. I'm going to mess with somebody here today. Go ahead and curl your toes up. I'm coming for them. Somebody say, Pastor, I, I, got, I got the power because I know the word. I know doctrine. I, I listen to sermons. I've been to church my whole life. I, I know all that stuff. But if we're not careful, we will know things that we can't manifest. See, manifestation doesn't come from knowledge and principles alone. See, it said true worshipers. Oh, y'all know where I'm headed with this one. True worshipers worship in spirit and truth. You have to have the truth of the knowledge. You have to have the knowledge on your mind. You have to know what you're talking about, but you must have spirit and truth. But watch this. Two verses later, 
From the opening text that we were at, Paul, he was talking two verses later. He tells us what happens when you have scripture and no spirit. I don't know if you're making a connection. I hope you are, and I'll explain it here in a minute. But I'm trying to tell you, I'm answering questions that you've had about others for a long time. I'm answering questions you've had about yourself. I'm answering questions about your cousin's church and that other church across town. The scripture today is answering some questions for you, and I'm hoping that it reveals some things in your mind. Paul's saying, here's what happens when you've got scripture and no spirit. When you've got structure... But it's not filled. He said this, 2 Timothy 3 and 7, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. What he's saying here is that when you deny the power, you can have knowledge and never have revelation. Another picture moment. Knowledge stirs the mind of man, but revelation unlocks the power of God. See, you and I can deny the power, and we can still have a form without the fire. But, but please hear your pastor here this morning. If you deny the power of God, and this is a warning to you, if you deny the power of God, you're going to believe anything. Because you're going to focus on finding new knowledge. Because there's not ever enough knowledge to satisfy what only the Spirit can satisfy. You're going to be searching here and searching there and searching everywhere. Trying to learn something new. Trying to educate yourself. A new book, a new podcast, a new church, a new sermon. Always trying to learn, never coming to the full knowledge of truth. You'll focus on new knowledge and always learning. But you hear this warning, you'll find yourself in agreement with the enemy. You'll find yourself embracing the forbidden. You'll find yourself embracing darkness. You'll find yourself compromising on biblical conviction. You'll find yourself compromising on doctrine because you're always finding new knowledge, but not the spirit guiding that knowledge. If you're with me, say amen. amen. Get this. The power is your strength, but it's also your protection. If you deny the power, you essentially give permission to the enemy to attack your life and your home. That security system that you may have at your house, turn off the power. Turn off that battery backup power that you might have. Turn it off and see what good it does. Without the power... The security goes away. We can't have scripture alone without the spirit protecting us. I, I, be, I couldn't preach more about the importance of the word. Nobody misunderstands me in this room. Nobody misunderstands that this is, I'm not diminishing this a bit. It is equally as important, but they are equal in importance. The letter killeth and the spirit maketh alive. We can't have just one thing. We must have both. That one thing is meant to kill the flesh. One thing is meant to, to sacrifice what we have here on earth, this flesh, this form that we're dealing with, and the spirit brings that back to life. With no power, there's no security. I've watched people as a pastor for many years in, in this and not as a senior pastor role, but in ministry over the past 25 years, I've watched as people, they've shut the power of God off in their home. For whatever reason, they shut it off in their home. And the enemy has wreaked havoc on their home because of it. And I'm trying to tell you here today, it's the presence and the power of the Holy Ghost that cannot be considered as extra sprinkles on top. It can't be considered, the power of the Holy Ghost can't be considered as the side of guacamole that you might get or might not. It can't be considered maybe getting some sour cream on the side or not. It can't be considered something that I might choose or I might not choose. It's not an extra added benefit. It's not a gift that's meant for a select few. It is not a blessing. The power of God is not a blessing for your life. That's not what it should be considered. It is an essential ingredient for your life. 
We can't look at the power of God and say, boy, that's a nice benefit. I hope I'll add that to my policy someday. You know who it's for? It's for you and your children and for all who are afar off. Every last one of you, it is God's plan from the very beginning. What he forms, he plans to fill. If you're alive and you're breathing today, you are a form. And God says, I plan to fill you with my power, with my spirit. It's nothing to be afraid of. Nothing to be weirded out by. There's a lot of things I don't understand in this world, and it kind of makes me uncomfortable sometimes. I'm like, I don't understand that. Whatever it is, whatever we don't understand sometimes makes us uncomfortable. When it comes to the Spirit of God, you're never going to fully understand it. I'm trying my best to convey some better picture for you today, but either way, you'll never fully understand it. You just need to embrace the fact that it is what you need and it's what you were designed to have. We were preparing for a uh, missions trip. Uh, a few months ago, and, uh, and we, they, we, we found out when we were there, they, well, we on, on the way there, they've got different power there. So they, we've got 120 volts over here, and over there they've got 240 volts, so a lot of, a lot of some stuff works, a lot of stuff doesn't work. Appliances definitely don't work over there if you try to do that, so you have to buy a converter. So we went, and we were like, all right, we got us a converter. So we got the converter at the house, and, and I'm testing it out, and, and, and uh, it works great. And this is a great converter. Thanks, to Amazon. You good reviews. And we, that's nice. And then we like, we need a hair dryer because I got this crazy mop on my head and my wife has a lot of hair. We're gonna, we gotta at least look somewhat presentable. So we gotta get a hair dryer because they didn't have one uh, in the hotel we were staying at there in Africa. So we get these hair dryer, we get our converter, everything works great. We get over there to the hotel, and it's like one of those mornings we gotta get up at like five in the morning, you know, and here we go, we're getting up early, and it's time to blow dry my hair, and then I don't know if anybody in here that was on that trip with us had the same issue that I did. I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I don't think I'm like the dumbest guy in the world either. (laughs) But I'm struggling because they've got light switches that are like power switches, and they're all over the room. Is anybody that was on that trip give me an amen? Amen. Maybe a couple. Okay, okay, okay. Because y'all, was any of y'all struggling too? I felt like all I wanted to know was I need need to feel seen right now because I couldn't figure out what button went to what okay so there's a button at the front door at the right of the door and that's like a master switch for all the other power in the rest of the room okay and then if you take your key out of the slot then it turns off all the power which is okay they can put that back in so then we're like but we need to and i need to go get some ice but it turns off i can't get back in unless my wife is going to be in the dark i don't know what to do all right so when we figure that out then we go and i'm turning switches and it's early in the morning, and then there's a switch by the bed that's also a master switch. And then it's all upside down, so like on is down, <laughs> and then up. So I'm doing this, and it's like dark, and I'm, 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 I'm just sad. I'm very sad. And I'm trying to figure out these switches, and I'm like, my wife is looking at me like, is it, you know, do you want me to help? I'm like, you know, you know what's going to happen right there. I'm a man. No, I got this. I needed help in a bad way, but I got this. And I'm like, so it's flipping switches, flipping switches, trying my best to figure out. Finally, I get my little inverter, the red light, to show up because it wasn't showing up. So the red light is on. That means I got power. And then I get out, I get out my hair dryer, and we got this hair dryer that we got, and I tested it out. It works really good at home. And so I get it plugged up, and it's time to dry this, this craziness because if it doesn't, y'all, you don't want to see me. It, it doesn't look like this. And when I, yeah, it doesn't look like this naturally, that's for sure. It, it, okay, so I get this out, and it's time to try to blow dry our hair because we got to go. Got the whole church waiting on me, the whole crew waiting on us. So it's time. So I plug it up, get it in there, turn it on, and I hear, oh. I hear the sound, but there's no wind. I'm, I, and I got it hold right up to my hair like this. I'm not, so it's going to like suck it in there. Like, I, I, I can hear it. I'm like, it's going. Babe, babe, listen. Nothing. There's a problem. There was a power problem. 
Something went wrong and there wasn't the power between what was like what is supposed to be at our house and what was over there and the converter wasn't giving it the right power so I had the sound but I didn't have the wind. Listen, it may have the sound, it may have the form, but if it doesn't have the power, it doesn't have the wind. I'm not satisfied with the sound in this house. We need the wind of the Holy Ghost. I'm not satisfied with the form. We need the fire of the Holy Ghost. Because when the spirit moves, that's when chains break. When the wind blows, that's when walls fall. When the power of God fills the house, uh, there's no room for fear. There's no room for doubt. Uh, there's no room for emptiness. Uh, I want more than just a Sunday sound. Uh, I want the presence of God filling every corner of my life. Uh, I want the presence of God filling every corner of this room. Can I get an amen? Let's all stand in the house. Let the Holy Ghost fire fill this room from the back to the front. Let the Spirit of God move in our homes. That's what we want. We want to win. Listen, I, I saved the best to last. Y'all ready for this? I need that old song. Bum, bum. Y'all ready for this? Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> Acts chapter 2. Oh, that's the bread and butter right there, folks. Oh, I like it already. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord and in one place. What's that saying? They were in one form. One place. One shape. One form. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled what? It filled the form, the whole form, where they were sitting. And then they all were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. Every last one of them, when they were filled, they began to speak. God said, I want you to know that I'm in here. I want you to know that I'm in here. And when I do, I'm going to give you some evidence of that. And they began to speak with other tongues. Since the very beginning, it was always God's plan to fill that which was formed. He formed the earth and he filled it with life. He formed the temple and he filled it with his glory. He formed you and me and his plan is to fill us with his spirit. What God forms, he intends to fill. Church, this is your moment. It's time to step into his promise. If you're tired, he's here to fill you with strength here this morning. If you're empty, he's here to fill you with his spirit. If you're broken, he's here to fill you with healing today. I want everybody in this room that says, I want a fresh dose of God's spirit to start joining me at this altar.